Hi, I'm Walt Robinson. I'm a professor of atmospheric sciences at NC State University. And I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about what climate and climate change means for gardens in general and here in North Carolina. So the context for all this is Earth is getting warmer from the greenhouse effect. And it's happening because we're putting heat trapping or we call them greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And those gases, mostly CO2 or carbon dioxide come from our cars and trucks, from power plants and from our farms too. And we see over here on the right, we see a map that shows how much warmer the earth is um, in this last year, the last full year, so 2020, compared to a 30 year average from the middle of the last century, from 1950 to 1981. And these, these colors, the color scales at the bottom, uh, you've got to bear in mind when you're looking at this that the, these are degrees centigrade. So to compare them with our familiar Fahrenheit degrees, you'd want to multiply by almost two. So these are some pretty big warmings almost everywhere on the world. In the United States, biggest warming up in the Arctic, but plenty of warming here in the US. And that's happening locally. We see that in the whole country and the whole world, but we see it in North Carolina. In fact, uh, not this last year, but the year before was the warmest year we've ever recorded in the state of North Carolina. And that map you're looking at shows how much warmer 2019 was compared to all the record uh, of previous years, which we call a normal as an average 30 year average. And basically every part of the state was significantly warmer, averaged over 2019 than the historical records. Uh, so it was a warm year. 2020 was warm, but also very warm, but not quite as warm here in North Carolina. So what's gonna happen in the future in the future, it's gonna get warmer still. In the wintertime, that might be pretty nice. But in the summertime, it means more really hot days. And these are projections. So you see a plot on the bottom is the year. And what's actually graphed is the number of days in each year that's predicted to be above 95 degrees. So those are really hot days. And this is in Eastern North Carolina. This is a projection for Eastern North Carolina. And we expect really hot summer days to go up. And the, an important point here is there's three, there's different colors and they're different what we call scenarios because this is the future and it's hard to predict the future. So what happens in the future, how much warmer it gets depends on how much of the CO2 and other greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere. So the extremes will get more extreme if we keep what we call business as usual, if we keep putting more and more of the stuff into the air. We could easily end up by, oh, even um, by a couple of decades from now, the middle of this century, an extra month a year of days where it gets above 95 degrees, really hot days. So the talk today is supposed to be about gardens. So what does this mean for gardens and for people who are gardening in North Carolina? And what I'm gonna talk about is really four things. Um, more dangerous heat, the soil is gonna dry out faster, so things are gonna dry out faster under the heat, we can get heavier rains, but the winter temperatures won't be as cold. So there are things we can potentially grow and start growing even now that we haven't been able to grow in North Carolina in the past. So what about that heat? We have this thing we call the heat index, and sometimes people call that feels like temperature, how hot it feels. And the point is it's heat plus humidity. When the humidity is higher, our bodies, our human bodies can't shed that heat as fast. And so we can get overheated. And you can get heat exhaustion and heat stroke and heat can actually be deadly. So really high values of heat index or when this heat index, and it depends on temperature and humidity. So you get those redder numbers and then off the chart numbers at the bottom right of that graph when it's really hot and really humid. Um, those numbers, those really hot days, those high heat index days where it feels really hot are projected to increase. And that's dangerous if we're working outside. So this again is looking forward projection into the future based on our climate models. And you can look at North Carolina and those maps and you'll see that there are more and more days projected depend where the heat index is gonna be really it's gonna be just too hot to do anything outside. It's gonna to be too hot in the afternoon to work in your garden. 
and uh, really an additional up to an additional month of days that are dangerously hot in Northeast North Carolina. The other thing you see, there's two maps there and the lower one is if we put more CO2 in the atmosphere, the top one is we put less. And even looking ahead just a couple of decades, these are projections for 2050, it makes a difference. So it's gonna be hot under any circumstances, but it'll be hotter still if we put more CO2 in the atmosphere. We start throttling that back, it won't be quite as extreme. So exponential. I'm gonna explain why I'm talking about exponential. People love that word exponential. Everything is exponentially big and it's way overused, but here's a, th in climate change, exponential really applies because as the atmosphere gets warmer, it can hold exponentially more water vapor. And that's what that graph shows. It shows the increase in water vapor, possible amount of water in the atmosphere as temperatures increase. And that's roughly an exponential curve. That's a true exponential. So that has two impacts for climate change. First of all, there's more water that can be in the atmosphere at higher temperatures, which means the heaviest rains, the downpours we get can be heavier. And that's a significant increase. For every degree of uh, warming, it's maybe a three or, three or so percent increase in the heaviest rains we can get. So we have a few degrees of warming, you're talking about the heaviest rains becoming 10% or more heavier. And we're already seeing that happening. The other thing that happens is when it's not raining, when it's dry, the atmosphere wants exponentially more water and it can sort of suck that, at high heat, suck that water out of the soil and plants and things can dry out much, much faster at high temperatures. So let's talk about the downpours. We're already seeing, and we've seen some historical events just the last few years, this is uh, on the bottom right. You're seeing a map of the rainfall, estimated rainfall that fell with Hurricane Florence a couple of years ago in 2018. And it was a huge rain event, particularly actually in, in Southeast North Carolina feet of rain falling from that one storm. And we're getting more rain from hurricanes. We've always had hurricanes in North Carolina. We get more rain from hurricanes, each hurricane, as the temperatures get warmer, particularly as the Atlantic Ocean off our coast gets warmer. The other type of rain that's increasing is the rain we get from everyday storms, regular cloud bursts. And this is actually, these are data we're, we're looking at at the uh, bottom left, is the number of days uh, averaged over five year periods because rainfall varies a lot from year to year. But it's how much, how many of these really heavy rain events we're getting in each five year period. And as we go forward over the period of record from way back in 1900 through 2000 and into this century, we see those heavy rain events are increasing with time, as we expect from, from this exponential effect of more water vapor in the atmosphere. So the drying side, once the ground is dry, it can heat up faster. Once the high heat has evaporated the water in the ground and all the sunlight hitting that ground, it doesn't get used up evaporating water anymore. It goes right into making the air hotter. And so that's what we call a positive feedback loop. And that's what the schematic is showing on, on the right-hand side of the slide, that over a course of a heat wave, you get less and less moisture in the soil, with the author of that paper called progressive desiccation. The soil gets drier and drier. More and more of the sunlight striking the surface of the earth gets converted into just making it hotter. And that layer of hot air gets deeper and hotter over time. That also means if you're in a place where fire is a risk, things can dry out faster, what we call flash droughts, and rapidly increase the risk of a wildfire. And we see that especially happening, not so much so far in North Carolina, but of course we see that happening a lot in California. And then we see from the data um, on the left that these heat waves are getting more frequent and the season of the year from, early, from spring into fall, the, the, hot, the heat wave season is getting longer and longer with time at a bunch of US cities. So we see that this, we're getting more heat waves and we're getting faster drying from heat waves from this exponential effect again. So I talked about new things to grow, if you're a gardener, you may be familiar with hardiness zones. They're really determined by how cold it gets in the winter because it's winter, cold winter temperatures that kill plants. So uh, these hardiness zones 
And you can look at the map online and then you can pick things out of your garden, your seed catalog that you can grow. And the colder winter temperatures in North Carolina are getting less cold and we expect them that to continue with time. So the hardiness zone, that's the hardiness zone from uh, the last century at the top graph for the US and the bottom one is a projection for the middle of this century, centered you know, around 2060. These hardiness zones are shifting north and we're expecting that to continue. And already we see this, someone in Lincoln County, North Carolina is already growing citrus. So that kind of growing tropical, subtropical plants is gonna become more common and probably more popular because it's kind of fun to grow oranges in North Carolina. So that's a good thing. So what can gardeners do about climate change and climate? First, most important thing is to watch out for the heat you haven't seen before. As it gets hotter and hotter, you're gonna have hot days, heat wave events, that's heat you've just never seen before. So you have to be ready for that. And assume if something was okay in the past, it may not be okay in the future. So you have to be safe. So more and more as it gets hotter in the summer, you're gonna to wanna to shift your gardening to early in the day or late in the day. And of course, drink plenty of water. As far as your garden is concerned, you're gonna to wanna to make your garden resilient to heat, to drought, and to these heavy rainstorms that are coming. And you could also enjoy growing some of these warm climate plants. Then you can make climate, you can make your garden part of the solution of addressing climate change, reducing our emissions of carbon dioxide. You can use less energy and you can actually use your garden to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere, sequester carbon, as we say. And finally, you can help observe how the climate is changing by becoming a Kokora observer. That's a cooperative um, network of people observing the weather, rainfall in particular. I'll say more about that right at the end. So heat and drought. The best way to combat heat is to maintain and enhance your shade canopy. Of course, gardeners love sun because plants love sun, but particularly in places shading your, around your home, if you have deciduous plants in particular, then you get the you benefit of the sunlight in the wintertime, but in the summertime, that, that shade canopy cools, you, cools your house, protects it from heat, and also plants re cool by their transpiration. And that's gonna reduce your energy use um, and save you money. Cooler gardeners, cooler gardens with a something of a shade canopy. It prote protects you when you're working in the garden. It also protects your plants from heat stress, and it means the soil will dry out more slowly if you can keep it cooler. As far as drought is concerned, you want to keep the water that does fall on the landscape. You can do that with rain gardens and rain barrels. You're going to have to expect more of these fast drying events, these flash dry flash drought events. So you deal with that by planting plants that are tough, that are drought tolerant or drought hardy. And then you can keep water in the soil by using mulch. So mulching is a really good way to prevent water loss. And you wanna do that because of course, because you can, <laughs> if things are drying out, you can water, but water uses energy and it costs you money in your water bill. So how about the heavy rain side? You have to start, we see this happening already with our streets and our roads and low flat and low lying areas. You just have to expect that floods are going to occur in places that never used to flood. And in a garden, rain means heavier rains mean more erosion. And in places where you have steep slopes, it means slopes can actually collapse as, they get, as the soil gets water, waterlogged. You don't want erosion, so you wanna prevent erosion and gullings. So you're gonna to have to as you're getting more of these heavy downpours, you're gonna to have to think more about how water moves off your landscape, moves off your garden. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna reduce paved surfaces because paved surfaces, of course, the water runs right off and it may run out into your garden or in the street and cause flooding. But you also get a benefit if you reduce the paved area, what we call the impermeable surface. If you minimize that, that also helps keep things cool because these paved surfaces heat up very, very rapidly in, when on hot days. So this may, might not be the time, thinking of climate change, to put a really big patio in your backyard, for example. And then gardeners can be a part of the solution. And there's a number of ways indicated there. Number one probably is to use less fertilizer. So if you can use natural fertilizers instead of chemicals fertilizers you buy from the store, Chemical fertilizers are produced by burning natural gas and the fertilizer itself produces 
nitrous oxide, which is another heat trapping gas when you use fertilizer. So there's kind of a double whammy there from fertilizer. You use less fertilizer, you're contributing less to global warming. Composting is really good because that organic matter, it goes into a landfill and breaks down in an anaerobic environment, it releases methane. And methane is a very, very powerful heat, heat trapping gas. Obvious thing is to use less energy. If you can garden more with, if you can garden with less use of power tools, use less energy, you're producing less uh, fossil fuels. People love to rototill, it's kind of fun. <laughs> And it's a nice way to create a bed for the garden at the beginning of the season. But when you do that, you help release the soil, the carbon that's trapped in the soil. You want that carbon in the soil, by the way, for healthy soil. It puts that into the air. So actually tilling and rototilling is a bad idea in terms of releasing heat trapping gases. Like a lot of things, like anything we buy, if we can buy local, there's less shipping cost, less shipping, uh, there's less shipping, less shipping cost, of course, and less energy used in shipping. Watering, I mentioned, uses energy. So if you can make your garden drought tolerant and water less, that's great. And then you can track carbon in the soil, what we call regenerative gardening. Perennials are great because they're, they're on the landscape all year round and they're storing carbon in the soil. So they're building up soil carbon. If you go back in, the, in history and look when the US, particularly the central US, had a lot of these tall grass par prairies, those soils were very, very deep and rich in carbon. And when those prairies were busted, as they say, to create modern agriculture, huge amounts of carbon dioxide was released into the atmosphere. So we can start to reverse that. Another way to store carbon is in trees. Long-lived trees store carbon in their trunks and the roots and help contribute to carbon stored in the soil. Final point is you can observe climate and that helps us know what's happening with the climate. And the way to do that is become a COCORA, Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Network, COCORA Observer. And to do this, you get a rain gauge, which is shown on the slide. You can uh, uh, re record very easily daily rainfall from your rain gauge. That's a, that's a screenshot of a phone app, smartphone app. And if you're interested, there's a website you can sign up to be a Kokora observer. We always need more information about where it's raining. And the person to contact more information is the coordinator in the state of North Carolina, uh, Sean Heuser. He works at the State Climate Office and he'll be happy to hear from you. And you can learn from him how to become a Kokora rainfall observer. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope I've given you some hints about how to deal with climate change and help address the climate change problem as a gardener. If you want to get in touch, there's my email and there's a picture. It's really not my garden. It's really my wife's garden in our Raleigh, North Carolina backyard. Thanks for listening.